the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this is The Gateway. It's Monday, August 12th. I'm Jonathan All, in for Abby Larico. He's known for his work in the front office, but Cardinals President Bill DeWitt III is also spending more time in the studio working on his art. There's something about having something that you've created yourself that is, is uniquely empowering, I think. The sports executive talks with St. Louis Public Radio's Abby Lurico about exhibiting his paintings for the first time and his plans for future works. That's coming up on The Gateway. A Ferguson police officer is in critical condition after he was harmed during a protest on the 10-year anniversary of Michael Brown's killing. Officer Travis Brown suffered a brain injury while trying to arrest a man who police say stole and damaged fencing outside the department. Brown remained in the hospital as of Sunday afternoon. At a news conference on Saturday, Ferguson Police Chief Troy Doyle says he doesn't understand why people are still protesting. Everything that the activist community has advocated for, as far as body-worn cameras, implicit bias training, crisis intervention training, we have done all of this. What are we protesting? Police say a 28-year-old man from East St. Louis slammed into the officer, causing his head to hit the pavement. He's facing charges for assault and property damage. Ten years after the police killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, a new short film titled Happy Birthday Mike Mike commemorates his life. St. Louis Public Radio's Lucretia Wembley has more. Michael Brown was born on May 20th, 1996 and would have been 28 years old if he was still alive today. The 12-minute documentary was filmed this year in St. Louis on Brown's birthday. His loved ones dance and embrace each other while sharing food and memories. The film features Brown's mother, Leslie McSpadden, celebrating her son's birthday for the first time publicly since his death. We will continue to uplift your name, uplift your honor, and continue to seek justice. We love you, Mike Mike, and we miss you so much. The film was created by production company Even Odd and features heartfelt birthday messages to Brown from across the country. I'm Lucretia Wembley, St. Louis Public Radio. St. Louis County is one step closer to seeing its health department qualify for millions in additional federal funds this year. Federal officials have accepted the county's application to grant its health clinics special status that would designate them as special federally qualified clinics. St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Fenton reports. St. Louis County operates three clinics in Berkeley, Sunset Hills, and Pine Lawn. Those clinics provide safety net services, including vaccines, dental services, and pediatric checkups. The county has asked the federal government to grant the clinic's status as federally qualified health center lookalikes. Such community health centers provide primary care to everyone, even those who don't have insurance. If federal officials approve the county's request, Medicaid and Medicare will reimburse the county at higher rates for the care it provides. It could also get prescriptions at lower prices and access to federal grants. The next step in the approval process is a federal site visit. U.S. Health and Human Services officials are slated to inspect the clinics next year. I'm Sarah Fenton, St. Louis Public Radio. A judge in southwest Missouri is holding the Missouri Department of Corrections in contempt for keeping an 81-year-old man in prison. Howard Roberts was sentenced to 20 years after he was found guilty in 2018 of committing fraud against an elderly woman. Greene County Circuit Judge David Jones ordered a retrial earlier this year after Roberts claimed he never received adequate counsel. Jones says Roberts must be released in the meantime based on state law. Similar to the cases of exonerees Christopher Dunn and Sandra Hemme, Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey is behind the stagnation. Jones on August 7th gave the department eight days to release Roberts or face fines of $1,000 a day. St. Louis County is getting a new flag. As St. Louis Public Radio's Lauren Brennicke reports, county officials are asking residents to decide what it will look like. The new flag is part of a $90,000 rebrand that aims to evoke an image of a growing county. Officials unveiled a new logo in January, but the flag could look completely different. The initiative is a collaboration with the Kranzberg Arts Foundation. Residents can create their own design or provide feedback on other ideas during a series of workshops. Attendees can learn about the flag design process and contribute their own suggestions this week. The first session is at 6 p.m. Tuesday at the Florissant Valley Library. Another session will be Wednesday at the new Clark Family Library in Ladue, and the final workshop will be Thursday at the Grants View Library in Crestwood. St. Louis County officials say they aim to show the region's vibrant community in the new flag's design. I'm Lauren Brennicke, St. Louis Public Radio. The 
The swing of a bat and the stroke of a paintbrush have at least one thing in common. St. Louis Cardinals president Bill DeWitt III is passionate about both. His art is on display for the first time this summer at a Central West End art gallery where he spoke with St. Louis Public Radio's Abby Larico. Have you ever done an interview about your art before? Uh, you're the first one to do a long form. Bill DeWitt III is no stranger to fielding questions. It's just that they're usually from his position in the front office, not in front of his paintings. Okay. His name has been tied to the St. Louis Cardinals since his family bought the baseball team in the 90s, and he became its president in 2008. But this summer, his name has also popped up at Square One Art Gallery, on labels, on the walls, yeah, I gotta take a picture of that. and in the signature at the bottom of his paintings. It's really fun to see it come to life in that environment. Several large canvases on the bright white walls depict monochromatic cathedral interiors. The more I manipulated it, the, the more interesting the image got. Similar, but so different, are these spooky glam paintings of skulls in shades of pinks and purples and covered in a layer of high-grade glitter called diamond dust. Skulls have been a very common theme in modern art for many years. These are good examples of his typical artistic process. He starts with an image, usually a vintage photo, and tweaks its colors and form with a graphic design program on his iPad. It's printed on a canvas, then layered with paint and other media. I just started getting good at that process, and my kids are like, send me one to my school dorm, and I was like, okay, and their friends were like, can I get one? And that's what was like the inspiration of Maybe I'm on to something here. DeWitt did study art history at Yale, but that's not a requirement to pick up on the pop art vibes of his work. Bright colors, bold lines, repetition, reminiscent of Deborah Cass or Andy Warhol. He says he never seriously considered art as a career. Payrolls and player rosters were always destined to be his primary medium, but he's never really given up interest. It was like maybe an itch that I wasn't scratching. Do you find that you're surprising people with this? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a, um, a random uh, thing that maybe they wouldn't have expected for sure. For me, I'm sort of the Cardinals guy. I'll always probably be that. But I also am um, a bit stubborn about these other aspects of my life that I, um, I like to pursue. He's found a creative coach of sorts in local artist Ted Collier, his friend and a partner at the gallery. I was so blown away because he's so, you know, typecast, for lack of a better word, as, you know, such a sports guy. It's said that people don't always just buy the art, they buy the artist. How does that play into choosing to represent him here at this gallery? I mean, I don't know how many, you know, fanatical baseball fans are going to come in here and... And, and buy paintings, but um, that's really not what it's about. It's, it's about the ability to kind of express yourself and, and give people that, that platform. President of a baseball team, you don't think of that as somebody who needs a platform. There's other people. There's like Jim Carrey. There's George Bush. There's a lot of people that you never would think in a million years would be someone that needed that creative outlet. He's got talent, and it, it just it needs to be exposed. On the day of this interview, the gallery was prepping for an event for another artist. A room of DeWitt's work would be open, too. It feels very collaborative and, and fun to be part of. Why isn't your first show Cardinals theme? People would buy that from Bill DeWitt III. I definitely don't didn't want to lead with that because that feels like maybe an obvious uh, trading on what I'm already known for. Um, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. The air conditioning has been pumping in here because it's going to be full of people <laughs> in a couple of hours. How do you hope that your work is received? You know, I obviously hope people like it. He says buy some art, sure, but he'd really like to inspire people to invest in their own creative outlets. Say, hey, if he can do it, maybe I can do it. I'm Abby Larico, St. Louis Public Radio. You can see photos of Bill DeWitt III's art on our website, stlpr.org. The Gateway is a production of St. Louis Public Radio, music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. We are a member-supported service of the University of Missouri, St. Louis. I'm Jonathan All, and from the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom, this has been The Gateway. <laughs>